In today's lecture, we're going to take a look at a more complicated case uh, than uh, as compared to what we did in the previous couple of, uh, couple of lectures. So today we're going to try to expand simple linear regression to include more predictor variables. So today's topic is multiple regression. All right. So the idea behind multiple regression is this. In previous uh, lecture, when we considered simple linear regression, um, I believe uh, we looked at a uh, very simplified uh, problem where we try to predict the price of the car based on the mileage of the car, and that's it. So uh, we, we got pretty uh, decent model in terms of the predict predictive power. Uh, our R squared was fairly decent, but yet at the same time there was a pretty su substantial room for improvement. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that mm, Mileage by itself, while being important variable, it's not everything. So there are other predicting uh, predictor variables that can play a role in um, predicting how much the car will be priced on the market. So, therefore, in simple linear regression, the idea is that uh, you have only one predictor variable, and that's it, nothing else. In multiple regression, which is our topic for today and probably next lecture as well, um, is to include as many useful predictors in the model as possible. So uh, what we're doing really is we're trying to say that um, the world is more complex than you know just one factor, right? In any model when you're trying to predict <coughs> certain variable, which is a target, based on some other variables which are called predictors, uh, more than one factor is always at the play. So therefore, in order to make model more realistic and more accurate, to predict the target better, we must include as many useful predictors as possible. So in this lecture, we're going to consider actually what uh, what does that mean, useful predictor. See, I'm, I'm using that word on purpose because, you know, I can throw into the model a bunch of other stuff, right? A bunch of variables that have nothing to do with what I'm trying to predict. And probably my model will get better each time when I throw some junk into that. But uh, that kind of against the whole idea of building accurate and at, at the same time fairly simple model. Okay, so uh, how do we expand uh, our model? So before uh, that in the previous lecture, when we looked at simple linear regression, that was the extent of our model, right? So we had, um, no, I apparently forgot to replace, that's supposed to be B. Um, that's our slope, okay? I'm going to replace that in the actual lecture notes. So uh, I'm uh, trying to model my dependent variable or target as the function of just one predictor, one independent variable, x1. That's it. So my model was very simple, b plus m times x. Now that I have included multiple different predictors, x1, x2, xk, I can have as many as I want. Um, each one of them has to be multiplied by a coefficient, the slope. Uh, so I have multiple different slopes in my model, right? So therefore, um, the difference between simple and multiple regression is that now, uh, when I say I want to construct, to build, to train a model, that means that I want to determine the values for the intercept and many different slopes. Each one of them corresponds to a separate uh, predictor variable. Okay. So my x1, x2, xk are independent variables. Oh, yeah, no, I got it. So, and uh, the b uh, is my um, intercept, vertical intercept. And of course, uh, uh, there is always uh, the fact that in spite of uh, our attempts to include as many useful predictors as possible, we're not, never going to be able to construct a perfect model that will be 100% accurate, right? So in order to predict, to calculate the actual values of my target variable, well, I have to include error variable, right? So that includes, basically the error variable includes all factors, all independent uh, variables that I either neglected to include or simply I couldn't do that because, you know, that's all I have, right? That's all the data. So as much as I want to include more variables, unfortunately, I don't have any more data, okay? Uh, or simply just purely random uh, factors that uh, I cannot account for, 
Okay, so all of that is included in the error term, which again uh, is unpredictable. So therefore, I just have to treat that as as such. So it exists, and there is not much I can do about that. All right. So uh, <coughs> just like for simple linear regression, uh, there are certain required conditions that I have to be uh, able to validate to verify uh, for the uh, regression methods for the regression model to be valid, accurate, uh, and uh, usable. So uh, my uh, error term, or epsilon, right? Um, if you remember from our previous lecture, we call that term residuals, right? Residuals are basically uh, errors which my model makes each time when I predict the value for my target variable, okay? So, simply speaking, this is the difference between the actual value minus predicted value, error, or, in more fancy language, I call, resid uh, I call errors residuals. So, same conditions apply as what we discussed for the simple linear regression. First of all, the average error uh, must be zero. Okay, so, on average, I should not, uh, my model should not over predict the value for the target, and it should not under predict the value for the target. So the average error should be zero. Some, er some errors are positive, some are negative, uh, but on average it should be zero. Number two, the distribution, the probability distribution, the histogram, right, uh, should look normal. So most of my errors, in other words, should be concentrated around the value of zero. And as I go too far on the right and on the left, so I'm looking at the large positive or negative values of the errors, I should see less and less of them. Okay, so therefore, my model, uh, so the other way how to, I can say that is my model should cut through the cloud of my points, um, through the center through the center of my cloud of points, right? And I should have, uh, mostly, <coughs> I should have my actual values to be concentrated around my predicted values, and, uh, uh, if I go too far from my predicted values, I should have less and less uh, of the actual value. So the differences within the actual minus predicted should be, uh, the more uh, higher the differences are, the more rare they should be, okay? That's another sign of the uh, quality model, okay? Uh, distributed normally, the errors distributed normally around zero, uh, around zero. Uh, then, uh, there should be no heteroscedasticity. I should not see any patterns where I uh, plot, for example, the residuals, and I uh, I see some sort of the conical shape. In other words, my residuals are getting higher or getting lower as I move along the horizontal axis. So my residuals should demonstrate. We call that homoscedasticity, right? It's uniform thickness of the residual plot. <coughs> so if thickness changes of the residual plot, then I call that heteroscedasticity, and that is an indication of possible issue with my model. Uh, yet another one is residuals should not reveal any patterns, such as trends, curves, uh, regular patterns. So it should, it should look, uh, ideal residual plot should look like a random cloud of points centered around zero, with uniform thickness uh, and uh, roughly speaking uh, number of residuals number of positive residuals and number of negative residuals should balance uh, should be equal to each other out <coughs> and then uh, another one we're not going to test this one uh, no we, we actually will test this one I'm sorry uh, X variables should be independent that requirement didn't exist actually in the previous uh, topic in simple linear regression simply because we had only one x variable uh, so there is nothing even to compare it against right uh, to to correlate uh, now that we have multiple predictors multiple x variables uh, our requirement is that different predictors should be uh, should not be strongly correlated with each other we're going to talk about that at the end of this uh, lecture probably not in this lecture but in the next one okay so uh, the first four requirements are exactly the same as we had for the simple linear regression. Every share is zero, errors are normal, there should be no heteroscedasticity, and there should be no weird patterns, or any patterns for that matter, in the residual plot. So 
exactly the same as we had for the simple regression. Number five is new and it applies only to the multiple regression. We have multiple different predictors. Okay, well, let's uh, get right into the example. Admission officer at the university is trying to develop a formal system of deciding how to admit students to the university. Now, let me kind of make, make a note here that it's probably, uh, uh, it, it's very applicable problem, okay? So if you think about uh, how do admission offices uh, at different universities make a decision, which students to accept and which students to reject, what are they looking at? Well, you know, you, you applied for the university, not so long ago, right? So university requires from you your high school transcript, right? They are looking at your high school GPA. They require from you standardized scores, ACT, SAT. Uh, some universities require from you a short um, sort of essay. Uh, they're, they're trying to, uh, to evaluate how well you can express uh, your ideas on paper, how well you can write, and some universities even <coughs> uh, want to interview uh, potential students, applicants. Uh, so there are a lot of factors that come into the play. Okay, so university collected all this data, right? SAT score, high school transcript, and then what? Okay, how do you look at the entire package, right? So and then what 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 is that you're looking for? Well, one way how universities can run their admission is uh, everybody is interested in high university GPAs. Students interested in high uh, GPA naturally, right? And at the same time, believe it or not, universities also want you to succeed in your classes. The reason is very simple, it's selfish actually, right? Uh, uh, if you don't do well in your classes, you will not get a decent job, and you will probably uh, kind of start spreading bad words about this university, right? Uh, so, but on the other hand, if you graduate with high GPA, you'll get a good job, high, uh, high paying job, very interesting with good companies, and um, you will do well for yourself, and at the same time you will uh, support by graduating uh, with, uh, with good jobs and good job offers, right? You will uh, keep spreading good words about uh, good fame, good vibes about the university right out there in the big, fat, scary world. So, <coughs> therefore, one goal could be, okay, how about this? I'm going to try and predict uh, the GPA of uh, applicant, each and every applicant, based on their input data. So, at the time when they apply, I don't really know whether or not they will get a high GPA at university or not so high GPA. Uh, it's a crap shot pretty much, right? Uh, but I can make an informed decision if I build some sort of the model or uh, a way to predict, right? Based on the incoming data, such as high school, um, GPA at the end of the junior year, GPA at the end of the high school, right here, right? Uh, also, <coughs> what was their SAT score? Also, uh, sometimes universities uh, want you to report your uh, activities, right? So, were you just, you know, taking classes uh, at high school or were you part of the, I don't know, earth club, chess club, um, computer programming club, uh, dance studio or whatever, right? So, and the uh, assumption here is that uh, the more different things you try in high school, the more active you are in the extracurricular activities, the uh, better your time at university is going to be. So, all these things I can include in my model, and the model will allow me to predict <coughs> uh, how high people will score in terms of their university GPA at the end of their junior year at the university. So after that, what I can do is a um, very simple thing, right? Each university basically uh, receives more uh, applications than they have seats in the incoming class. Let's say CNU receives 8,000, for example, applications, but they have only um, uh, about 1,200 uh, seats or beds in, in the dorms, no matter how you, uh, in what way you view that. <coughs> so they will accept 
right about 1200 maybe 1250 uh, different students so how how do they make the uh, the decision well one way to do it is predict for everybody their GPA at the university based on the incoming data and uh, rank order them from highest GPA to lowest GPA then take your top 1200 uh, predicted university GPAs and send them a uh, letter of acceptance okay now not everybody will accept right so a lot of students have the backup plan right so a lot of students will apply to <coughs> CNU, VCU, Virginia Tech, UVA, you know JMU um, and uh, depending on who will accept them they will they will make their selection so therefore you send your letter of acceptance to uh, your top 1200 students let's say out of them 700 will actually enroll and they will pay the, uh, the, the deposit right indicating their intent to actually take classes but the rest of them will not okay so what do you do you still have to fill 1200 seats right in the incoming class so then you move down the list and send <coughs> the admission letter to the uh, 500 next students etc so uh, and then each university actually deals with this type of process right <coughs> you uh, send acceptance letter to students some of them accept some of them don't then you move you know further down the list but in order to have a list you have to rank order students how well that's one way to do it predict the university GPA and just you know start from the top and move move down from there okay so uh, well let's take a look at the data okay so I am going to bring up the R studio and I believe the file is called GPA so I'm going to call it GPA data and read.csv and the file from C drive folder data gpa.csv okay cool and now let's take a look at the structure of the data right we pretty much have a good idea but let's take a look anyway okay so structure of the data is uh, as follows uh, small data set only 100 students right what do I know about each one of them these are students from my past right so pre probably people who are already graduated um, I know about them uh, their high school GPA at the time of application and that's a numerical uh, column I know SAT score well SAT is integer but basically also numerical differences between numerical and integer as you can see numerical is um, uh, it, numerical has decimal points and integer is just integer so it's point zero there is no decimals right and activities number of uh, hours per week in extracurricular curricular activities that students reported on their application so this is what I know for students coming in right applicants uh, and also about each of these 100 students I know uh, how high or low what was their university GPA uh, at the end of the junior year so after they spent three years at the university okay so this is my historical data okay cool uh, now let's uh, go ahead and try to build uh, the model right so for that I'm going to actually use uh, pretty much same function as I used for the simple linear regression so I'm going to call it multiple linear regression okay and uh, it's done by the function LM it's an abbreviation stands for linear model right function LM and uh, 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 the way how I record my model is actually kind of funky a little bit um, in what way uh, it, it looks a lot like what we did in uh, about three lectures ago when we discussed ANOVA okay so uh, and also we did exactly the same thing in uh, simple linear regression when we built simplified model predicting car prices based on the car mileage right so first I have to write uh, out my target right and in this case target is called uni underscore GPA stands for university GPA okay and then I say tilde tilde means that target is being predicted based on certain 
know, predict this, right? So in my uh, data set, the predictors are high school GPA. I'm going to write it out, HS GPA. And then I'm going to say plus. So I didn't have that before in the simple linear regression because, well, there was only one predictor. Now I have three, right? So high school GPA plus SAT plus uh, activities. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm listing my predictors. And the plus sign that I put in between predictors, that does not mean that I'm adding them. No. That means that I'm using high school GPA and SAT and activities as my three predictor variables. And uh, my target is called university GPA. So don't uh, don't treat that as I'm adding together a bunch of numbers. No, I don't. This is just a way to specify the model for the multiple linear regression. That's all there is to it. Okay, so, and after that, uh, just like in AOV function, analysis of variances, right, I have to specify what is the source of my data, which data to use to build or train. Some uh, Oftentimes, uh, uh, when people say build the model, uh, the, the, the word built is not even used. So I'm not going to build the model, I'm going to train my model. So I'm using the GPA data to train the model to predict the GPA for the future incoming students about which I know high school GPA, SAT and activities but don't know the university GPA yet. So the data is GPA data and that's it. So when I run this line, there it is. Okay. Uh, now, uh, before we proceed with the analysis of the uh, of the model itself, what I want to point out is this: um, as we discussed, the more predictors I have, the better apparently my model is going to be, right? So therefore, uh, here in this data set, I have only three predictors. That's not a lot, not too much, right? So I can easily add them all together. What if I have? Um, 20 predictors, or 50 predictors, or 100 predictors. Uh, do I have to explicitly write out predictor 1 plus, predictor 2 plus, predictor 3, etc., etc.? Well, sometimes when you have a lot of predictors, it's easier to do the following thing. So I'm going to just copy paste this line, and uh, uh, instead of saying over here, high school GPA plus SAT plus activities, I'm going to say dot. And that's it okay so these two forms form number one when i say high school gpa plus sat plus activities and that one where i say university gpa till the dot it's the same stuff okay so i can run this line and it'll give me exactly the same model <coughs> so dot essentially says that uh, okay this column is my target and all the other columns are the predictors okay so instead of writing out their names with plus signs in between them, I can just say dot and R will basically create this kind of expression for me. So each column, which is not university GPA, everything else except for university GPA, will be used as just uh, predictor variables. So that's how I can uh, write a bunch of predictors in a short, very shorthand notation. So this is just FYI. Okay? But uh, it, it gives me the same exact result. Okay, so now let's take a look at the model, right? So just like before, uh, in simple linear regression, I'm going to look at summary of my multiple linear regression. Bam! Here's my summary. I'm going to make it bigger. All right. <coughs> so uh, let's write out the equation just like before when I was. Um, when I was discussing simple regression, when we predicted car prices based on the car mileages, right? Uh, the main column is the very first one. It says estimate. Okay. So based on this sample of 100 students, I have estimated the um, uh, the values of my intercept. There you go. That's the slope that goes with high school GPA. Here is the slope that goes with SAT, and here is the slope that goes with a number of activity hours per week, right? So my model, okay, I'm going to write it out, my multiple regression 
uh, model equation. Okay, so there it is. Uh, comment this out. So, in order to predict university GPA, I have to take my intercept point nine eight seven seven. On the top of that, at point four four six three seven times uh, the high school GPA <coughs> plus. <coughs> Uh, point zero 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 one eight six six multiplied by SAT score plus point zero five zero four nine multiplied that by activities. Okay, number of activity hours, and that's it, pretty much. How do you like them, apples? <coughs> Excuse me. So. Now that I have the model, I can use that, right? How how do I use that? Well, let me go ahead and copy paste. So if I want to predict the, um, <coughs> let me call it predicted university GPA, okay? If I want to predict a GPA for somebody who graduated from high school with 3.5 high school GPA, and on the SAT they scored. I don't know, 1,210 points, and they self-reported four hours per week in extracurricular activities during their high school years, right? Then all I have to do is take this equation, plug in the specific values for high school GPA, SAT score activity hours, and just run the calculation. Simple as that. So now my predicted GPA is, predicted university GPA is 2.977. So, for somebody uh, who applies to the university with these parameters, high school 3.5 GPA, 1210 SAT score, 4 hours activities on average, uh, they are expected to be B average, slightly below B average, right? At the end of their junior year at the university. Simple as that, 2.997. That is just my point estimation, right? Of course, this is expected on average, right? So if I have a bunch of students like this, um, and uh, I, I, I track every single one of them, right? Their, their uh, junior year university GPAs, of course, are going to be all over the place, right? Uh, why? Because, well, I didn't include a lot of factors, right, in, in this model. So this model basically allows me, um, uh, that, that model relies only on your high school incoming parameters, right? Uh, there are a bunch of things that are not part of this model, okay? So, for example, is the GPA affected by the major choice? I'd say yes, okay? Uh, because, you know, if you if you pick uh, an easy major, then your GPA is expected to be pretty high, as opposed to something fairly intense, then you have to work really hard to get to high GPA. So, that can be a factor. Uh, and another interesting question to ponder, uh, is the GPA affected by male versus female, by the gender? Could be, I don't know. That part is not uh, included in the in the data, so therefore it's not part of my model, but it could be that males and females, uh, everything else being equal, they get different grades, right? What else can be a factor? Well, sometimes good students completely bomb their uh, university uh, classes, right? Why? Because there is a pretty big switch from high school to university, and not everybody adjusts nicely, okay? Uh, for example, um, social life, right? At the university, a lot of people, you know, especially if, if people, and I've seen that before, actually. I had uh, students in the past who were doing pretty well and then got super engaged with, you know, their fraternity sororities or what have you, and bam, GPA goes into the dumpster, basically, after that, right? So there are a lot of factors that uh, are uh, at the play um, when, when it comes to the GPA. But that's my that's my model, right there, okay? All right, so, uh, well, let's get do, let, let's, let's, let's do uh, pretty standard stuff with this model. First of all, let's uh, uh, try to interpret the coefficients, okay? So, let's try to interpret that coefficient right there okay so uh we did interpret actually different coefficients so this one is b1 right that's the slope for my very first uh variable sat I think it was b1 
v1 okay so how do I interpret that if you remember from uh, previous um, couple of lectures when we looked at predicting car prices based on the car mileage what did we do we said okay let's increase the mileage by one and in the context of this uh, problem I believe one meant 1,000 miles right because all the miles were in thousands of miles all prices were in thousands of prices right in thousands of dollars uh, so and the meaning of the slope was if you increase the mileage by one that means thousand extra thousand uh, miles on the car then your um, uh, the car price is supposed to go up by the amount of slope right point if I remember correctly zero six six nine something like that right of a thousand dollars okay so the standard interpretation of the slope in the uh, regression equation doesn't matter is it simple or le or multiple regression is uh, the slope for the variable represents the expected change in the target variable in our case it's university GPA when your predictor increases by one while other predictors are kept the same that's important addition okay because now we have more than one predictor okay I have to kind of isolate e each and every one of them right so uh, when my high school GPA goes up by one Okay, so let's say from 3.5 to 4.5, if that's at all possible, what effect does that have on the university GPA? Well, it increases by, so um, that means right here, I'm gonna I'll write it out, okay? Uh, if high school GPA uh, is increased by one, while uh, SAT and activities remain the same uh, then 0 0.04637 is the expected change in university GPA okay so that's my interpretation of B1 so if I change by one the uh, variable x1 while keeping x2 and x3 <coughs> the same then uh, this slope gives me the amount by how much my target will change okay similarly <coughs> how do I interpret that one well I can say that if my if my students <coughs> if a student uh, gets a better score on the SAT so SAT goes one point up okay while high school GPA and activity hours remain unchanged, then their expected high school, uh, the expected university GPA uh, will increase by 0 0.0001866 on average. So for each one extra point on your SAT score, it's going to be very minor impact on your expected university GPA, right? Uh, so, or I can interpret like this, okay? What happens if I get an extra 100 on SAT and nothing else changes? My high school GPA or activity hours remain the same. Well, this is by how much the university GPA will increase for just one point, right? So therefore, I can say that for a 100 point SAT increase, uh, university GPA, GPA, will increase by how much by the slope 0 0.0001866 uh, six, six, times 100 and that would be 0 0.01866 right? uh, 0 0.01866 so <coughs> you score 100 points higher on the SAT score your GPA will be impacted by approximately 0 0.02 right on average of course at the end of your uh, junior year same thing with this one right for each extra hour in the self-reported extracurricular activities per week from the high school your predicted university GPA is expected to increase by 0 0.0505 provided that neither SAT nor your high school GPA change okay so these are my three different interpretations for 
slope number one, slope number two, and slope number three. Now let's try to predict this, uh, to, to interpret uh, the free turn, right? The vertical intercept. Okay, so how do I interpret that? Well, <laughs> if my SAT is zero, then this term is out. Uh, no, if, if, sorry, if my high school GPA is zero, right? This term is out. If my SAT is zero, this term is out. And if uh, number of activities is zero, is, uh, then I get rid of this one, right? So therefore, I can interpret that value as this is the expected GPA for a student at the end of their junior year who didn't have, who has zero uh, GPA from the high school, zero points on SAT, and zero activity hours. And right now you can see that this doesn't make any sense, right? Such student wouldn't even exist, right? Um, uh, and even if they did, they wouldn't be accepted into any university at all. You have zero points on the SAT score and zero high school GPA. There are zero universities that will accept you. Okay, so therefore, unfortunately, this interpretation is not a valid one. We actually discussed the same very issue uh, in the previous couple of lectures when we talked about the uh, simple linear regression. Right? Oftentimes, what happens—not always, but oftentimes—what happens is uh, the uh, data point where all predictors are zeros is uh, outside of the data range that we use uh, for our regression. So therefore, oftentimes, we cannot really meaning in interpret uh, the um, uh, free term, the vertical intercept, in any meaningful way. Okay, And this is the case right here. Okay. So uh, that's a plain English interpretation. All right, now let's discuss a uh, second question, uh, which is important. Are all of my uh, predictors statistically significant? We discussed exactly the same question with uh, simple linear regression. Okay, and uh, I, I would have to remind you here that here's what I'm testing. For each and every single variable, predictor variable in my model, I'd have to test the following hypothesis. Now, that the uh, true slope for the, uh, what's my first variable, high school GPA. So we discussed that uh, these values, uh, vertical intercept, slope 1, slope 2, and slope 3, are called estimates for a reason, right? They're called estimates because uh, this is just an estimation of the slopes, and the vertical intercept that comes from that specific sample with 100 students, right? How many students are out there? Oh my God, thousands, tens of thousands, right? Maybe even millions, okay? And I can probably use this data set uh, if, if I wanted to find out the actual relationship, uh, actual coefficients. I would have to collect every single student, right? And include them in the sample. Uh, in this case, it would be actually the population, right? But I don't do that, okay? All I have is a sample. So from the sample, what I'm getting is the estimate of the vertical intercept, estimate for the uh, slope number one, estimate for the slope number two, etc., etc. okay? So, <coughs> therefore, I'm testing null hypothesis uh, that says that the actual uh, slope for the entire population uh, that corresponds to high school GPA is zero, right? That means that I can replace that value with zero right here, okay? Now that's true, and this is what happens. And in this case, whatever their high school GPA is, it stops playing a role, right? Because it doesn't matter, you, you multiply it by zero, so therefore that term is effectively eliminated from the equation completely, okay? So if I find in favor of the null, that means that the high school GPA is not a statistically significant predictor. Simple as that. Okay. Uh, and my alternative, of course, says something opposite to null, right? So it says that the true slope for the high school GPA is not equal to zero. So therefore, high school GPA is a significant predictor. 
okay, of the university GPA, obviously. Okay, so, and I'm testing this hypothesis for each and every one of my independent variables. Okay, so similar to that, I'm going to test, well, let me quickly write it out. Okay, null hypothesis, the slope for the SAT is equal to zero versus alternative hypothesis, the slope for SAT is not equal to zero and another pair is now slope for activities I'm gonna abbreviate ACT it's not it's not the standard I test it's activities okay equals to zero and alternative is slope for activities is not equal to zero these are the three hypotheses that I test okay so, where do I find the p-values? Just like in the simple linear regression case, p-values are right here in the column that says PR, probability greater than the absolute value of t. So, this is the p-value. Okay. Also, it provides the p-value for the slope, but traditionally we do not test slope. Okay. So, therefore, uh, don't pay any attention to the first line. We're going to test hypothesis for independent variables 1, 2, and 3. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, uh, and uh, by default, I'm going to use exa exactly the same thing, p-value or oh, significance level of 5%, 0 0.05, okay? So the first one, 1.63 e minus 06, that means times 10 to the power minus 6, right? This is a number with five zeros, right? So dot, then five zeros, then I have 163. Very small p-value. It's zero for all practical intents and purposes. So what do I do? Well value is small, I reject the null in favor of alternative, so what do I find? That I find that high school GPA is a significant predictor. I cannot replace this slope, I already erased from my equation, this slope right here, I uh, cannot replace it with zero, thereby getting rid of the high school GPA. So high school GPA must stay in the equation. Next one, SAT, 0.56, it's higher than 0 0.05, so therefore I fail to reject the null, and the null says that the SAT score is not a significant predictor for the uh, university uh, GPA at the end of the junior year, right? So in other words, SAT score can be eliminated from the model, and after that the model will not suffer greatly from such loss, okay? And in fact, uh, in the next lecture we're going to uh, take a look at um, what do we mean by that? If I eliminate SAT, the model doesn't suffer a lot. Okay, uh, so SAT is uh, essentially useless for predicting the university GPA. Okay, next one: uh, activity hours. So here is my p-value. Again, 0 0.008 is less than 0 0.05. Right? P-value is less than 5%. So therefore, I uh, reject the null in favor of alternative uh, and therefore number of activity hours statistically is related to the um, university GPA okay so out of these three predictors uh, I found out that SAT is not important it can be removed from the model and the model will not suffer huge consequences because of that okay while other two high school GPA a number of activity hours are statistically significant. Okay, so uh, how do we measure model accuracy? Okay, so let's discuss uh, this question. Or you know what? Uh, we're kind of pushing the limits of one uh, lecture at that point, so I'm going to stop recording right here. And in the next lecture, we're going to finish off the analysis of uh, this problem. And uh, also probably we'll take a look at another Another problem where we um, explore the importance of checking one of the required conditions, such as multicollinearity. Okay?